uh, being recorded in, in front of a live studio audience right now. Just sitting there. Good morning. Good morning, my name. Um, thank you for showing up. Uh, for some people, it's really difficult to get up in the morning. I'm just saying that because I'm one of those people. Um, but when we talk about unit tests, uh, usually it's, a, it's a something that, instead of making me get up early, it usually keeps us <coughs> late at night up and trying to fix a lot of problems. So this talk is hopefully going to help you, even today or tomorrow, start fixing a lot of things that might be painful uh, when you do unit testing. And it's all based on, of course, true stories. So there is nothing here that actually hasn't happened to me in one way or another. So all these things were learned in the hard way. And it's all based on The Art of Unit Testing, which is a book that I wrote. I'm currently writing a second edition. So if you, if you, has anyone here read that book, by the way? Okay. So I'm writing a second edition. So whatever you read in that book doesn't mean anything. <laughs> that book is just wrong. I don't know the idiot that wrote that. Actually, that book was written, it started, it was, start, I started writing it more than six years ago. So the first chapter was, was finished more than six years ago. And when I started writing that book, I didn't have any kids. When I finished it, I had two. Okay? So many things changed, <laughs> even my world point of view since then. Um, now, these practices will help you uh, whether you are working in Java, in .NET, in Ruby, in JavaScript. How many people here in .NET land? Okay, Java. What else is there? JavaScript, Ruby. And the rest are just marketing people, I guess. Now, uh, you, can, you, you can find a lot of other material, a lot of videos from a lot of other places where it was recorded in front of a live studio audience at artofunitesting.com. So if you ever want to get deeper into the thing that I teach, you can always uh, contact me in this email or just go to this address. And you can al always find me here doing courses on this stuff. Um, and I actually moved to Norway so I can do more of these because I kept coming from different countries here. So moving here was actually uh, an adventure with the family. But we'll talk about that later if you want. Okay, so what does it mean to, to have practices when you do unit tests? Uh, we're talking about making tests that are good. And most tests that people write, when they start out writing unit tests, they start out writing really crappy tests. I started out with writing really crappy tests. Uh, the first project that I ever started working on when I was a team lead, we started doing test driven development. And I had no idea what I was doing, but we were doing it anyway, because that's the best way to learn, to actually start doing something. And about six months into projects, we actually started deleting some of the tests, because whenever we started changing the code, the tests were screaming at us that something was wrong. They weren't compiling. And, and at some point, we just realized it's not worth the time to write those tests, because they were actually hurting us. The time it took to maintain the tests was actually hurting. And it wasn't saving us any time on debugging, because the, all the time was spent on maintaining and re rewriting those tests. So maintainability is one of those things that if you don't take care of when you write unit tests, it's going to come back and bite you. But there was another issue. When we ran tests and we uh, saw the results, we didn't trust the results. How do you know you don't, don't, you don't trust the results of your tests? Well, if you run the test and it passes, and you still debug the code just to make sure, that means that you don't trust the test result. And the, one of the points of the test is that they're trying to save you debugging time. So if you're doing debugging after running tests, something is wrong. You don't have the trust that you need to have. So we'll talk about tests that will give you more trust or ways to do that. And readability. New people came into the project. They had no idea how to maintain the test because the tests were unreadable. And readability is usually the last thing you think about when you write your tests. But it should be the first. Together, these three things actually make our tests helpful. But if you break even just one of them, it affects all the other 
uh, subjects, all the other pillars, if you will. <coughs> so, uh, trust, maintainability, readability. RTM. So someone said, oh, that's RTM tests. And someone said, oh, you just call it RDFM, because they have to be fast. So that's our definition of good tests, RDFM tests. If you're a developer, RDFM might mean something else to you, but that's the way I remember it. <coughs> Another thing we're going to do today <coughs> is that if we want to change the culture or organization and write better tests, or actually just start writing tests, we have to start reviewing other people's tests. Because the best way to teach is to sit with someone and review their code and go through your thought process. It's a person-to-person -person interaction. So if you review someone's code with a tool far away from where that person is actually sitting, you're going to be much less effective. And that person is not going to learn almost anything. <coughs> if you want to do good code reviews and test reviews, you have to sit with the person before they check in the code, see the diffs, and actually talk through things that you don't like about the tests. That way you actually transfer knowledge. And I would suggest that if you were doing code reviews and you'd start doing test reviews, your code reviews will actually go quicker. Because tests, they're supposed to convey the intent of the person who's writing. So sometimes if, if, uh, if I look at someone's code and I read 50 lines and after 50 lines I realize Oh, you delete the person, but only after the login <coughs> failed. No, you got it wrong. But it took me 50 lines of code to figure it out. It took me 10 minutes. But sometimes, a good test, I just look at the name of the test. And I realize that that requirement was misunderstood. So it saves me a lot of time to make sure that people actually understand what they're trying to do. So tests written, not, written in a good way, or in a readable way, will actually help you figure out problems in the requirements understanding of the developers. So all these three things, as I said, they play together. And we're going to cover each one of them. First of all, we're going to cover trust. Because without trust, it doesn't really matter that you have tests. If you have a thousand tests and you never run them, or you run them, but you don't care about the results, then it's just wasted time. And you know, <coughs> I know plenty of companies where People run the tests, you get the latest version from source control, you right click to run all the tests, and then 30 of them fail. So let's say you didn't write those tests and you look at your team and say, what's going on? And someone in the team says, don't worry about it. That's the best thing ever. Don't worry about it, it's okay. Because you're missing a database, because you're missing a configuration file, because you're missing something. But that test would have passed if you had the right configuration in your machine. And so as a developer, what happens is that I hear the word don't worry about it, and I stop worrying about it. And so maybe the test is actually failing for a good reason, but I stop believing the test. So how do we, we avoid that problem? One way I found to avoid it is we separate everything that's not a unit test into a separate project. And here we have to define what is a unit test. So a unit test is something that runs in memory, is fully automated, has full control of everything that it does. For example, uh, it can control the current date and time of the program. If you cannot control it, then it's not a unit test. And everything that's not a unit test is an integration <coughs> test. So integration tests belong in a separate folder, in a separate project. They are important, but they're not unit tests. And the reason I want to have a project with just unit tests is because I want to be able to get a latest version, right click on the unit test project, and because it's all in memory, and it's all automated, and it's repeatable, and everything has control, there shouldn't be any problems with configuration or missing databases. Because an uh, integration test is something that might talk to an external database or the file system. A unit test runs only in memory, with full control of its dependencies. So they should all be passing. I should have a fully green project running where all tests are passing. So if I'm able to have this one project where I call it the safe green zone, get the latest version, you run all the tests, and you should all be passing. And if one of them, even just one, is not passing, I should actually feel worried. I should feel like something is wrong. That's trusting your test. But if you have mixed integration in unit tests, then the integration test might fail for the wrong reason, for the right reasons, <coughs> 
but you stop believing the, te the results of all the projects. Some of them fail, some of them pass. Yeah. Some of them pass every third time you run it. Some of them pass after 12 a.m. Some of them pass every third time, but only if you run this test before. I'm sure that never happened to you. These are examples of integration tests or tests that are not isolated from each other. We'll talk about these problems. But you should always have, for each project, a unit test project and an integration test project, at least. This is an example of what usually happens. You have a test project. It doesn't say if it's unit test or integration test, and there's just one. That tells me there is no separation between integration and unit test. So there should at least be at the project level. So when I review people's code, I can move the tests to the right project. Code coverage. A lot of companies worry about code coverage. I'm here to tell you you shouldn't worry about code coverage if you're not doing any code reviews. Code coverage, if you have 100% code coverage, it's meaningless. It has nothing to do with any code quality whatsoever. It just means that your tests execute the code. When you tell developers, give me 100% code coverage, you're going to get it. But it doesn't mean that they're testing anything. Because what they're doing is they're playing to the metrics that are required. So they can write tests that have no inserts, that they're not really testing anything. They're just executing the code. You might have a thousand tests that don't have an exception, but they're not checking that something is true or false. So code coverage with code review and test review means something. Okay? High code coverage without code review means nothing. Low code coverage always means something. If you have 10% code coverage, it always means something. What does it mean? You run your test, you have 10% code coverage. What does it mean, good morning? It means something, what does it mean? Someone has to answer and I'm gonna continue. <laughs> if I told you you had 10% code coverage, what would you think happened? What's missing? <laughs> Any answer will do. Use cases? Oh, thank you, Mark. That's <laughs> cheating, by the way. <laughs> and it's also wrong. Damn it. <laughs> What's missing if I have if I run my tests and I get 10% code coverage? 90%? 90% of what? Of the rest. <laughs> of the rest. What's missing is tests. Thank you for actually saying something. Very un-Norwegian of you. <laughs> um, we're missing tests if we have 10% code coverage. But if we have 100%, we don't know, unless we actually look at the test code and see that the, the test makes sense, that they are actually testing something. Now, when I review a people's code, if I wanted to check that the person actually did test-driven development versus just test after, I, I make it a personal requirement for me that I sit with them and I, and I look at, the, for example, a test. And I go into the code and I change something from true to false, for example. <coughs> now, if you go into the production code and you change something that was always true to, to always being false, something is got, it, that's a bug. You're actually inserting a bug into the code. Something should fail. So I change that and I run all the tests. But before I do that, I ask the developer one question. What do you think? Something's going to fail or not? And based on their answer, I can tell if they did TDD or not. Because if they go, mm, maybe, I know that they wrote the test after. If they wrote the test before, they're going to say, yep, definitely that's going to fail. Or they're going to say, oh, I didn't think of that. But they will say it immediately, with confidence. Because when you write test-driven development and you split things into small chunks, every line has a reason to exist. So that false or that true was there because a test was failing until that true was there. And when I changed it, that person remembered the test that they wrote, especially for that little variable. And that's a, and it also says something else. If I'm the team leader and I review people's tests, and I take this close attention by going and actually looking at the code and maybe changing something and giving that personal attention, it means that I care. I care about unit tests and I care about the code quality. It means that unit testing is not just some phrase that we're throwing around in the office. It means that it's actually something that's expected of you, something that's important. 
And that's how you build culture, is that you make the time to sit with your team and review the code. You want to trust your tests, you should avoid any logic in your tests. This is an example. We're going to start showing real examples of uh, open source uh, code from various languages. This is from a project called Microsoft Unity. And the problem with this, there are multiple problems with this test, but the biggest problem for me is that there is a loop here. Okay, and the reason is that I don't want any logic to be in the tests. And the reason is, is that tests are supposed to live with your code. And your code is going to exist for five, ten years. Over five, ten years, tests that have logic are also likely to have a bug. Now, if you're going to have a bug in your test, how are you going to find out? Are you going to write a test for your test? How do you know that the test for the test doesn't have a bug? You're going to write a test for the test for the test? So it's a very recursive problem. So to avoid that, I would usually say, don't write any logic in the tests. <coughs> it should be just very simple, short statements. Do this, do that, assert this. If you have a loop, maybe you're using too many things. Maybe if you just have two of these things, you can just go to asserts instead of looping all of them. Even loops can have bugs. You're looping on too many things or too little things, etc. <coughs> there are other things wrong with this test. There is magic numbers, 37. What the hell is 37? Nobody knows. The reader of the test will never understand it. We'll talk about magic numbers a bit later. Here is a nicer example of logic. This is actually not a unit test. This is a helper method that a unit test would use to organize uh, uh, the behavior of some HTTP. So this helper method gets parameters and returns a fake HTTP context. Now, it doesn't really matter what that fake HTTP context is or what it's going to be used for. What's important is that there is logic here. All these ifs can have bugs. So imagine if there's anything worse than a test having a bug that you're not going to find out about until you realize after you looked at all the production code for why the test fails and then you start looking at the test so you've wasted a day. So if you haven't looked at the test, you're never going to look at the helper method that the test uses. So this is even worse. This is really down in the, in the pipes. So we have these ifs and ifs can have bugs. It can be wrong, and suddenly the behavior of the test is wrong. It seems to be passing, but we don't know if it's actually good. So we have to get rid of these ifs, and one of the ways is to give overloads that don't that need parameters, but for each parameter there is a separate overload. So we don't need the ifs. If this is the overload that takes an app path, we're always going to use an app path. There is no if. There is no spoon, if you will. So different overloads. Don't make very generic methods that take a lot of parameters to be configured in the tests. Instead, use very simple methods that do just one thing. A uh, another thing that happens a lot in tests that uh, will make me not trust it is when I see logic in the asserts. Now, the definition, the, what I call it is that when you, the, the thing that is expected is dynamically built, you're likely repeating production code. So here we're creating a message of user password and we're expecting a concatenation of these strings, some message builder, if you will. But instead of asserting on the final string, a hard-coded string, we're creating the expected string of what it should look like. And this is probably also repeating, there's some production code that's doing the same thing. Now, what's the problem? First of all, we could have a bug here. This is a piece of logic. For example, maybe we're missing a space of what the actual screen should contain. We, and since we're probably repeating production logic, and we wrote the initial bug in the production logic as well, you we could have the same bug here. So we could actually be repeating the bug from production in our tests. So our test will actually pass instead of fail. Our test is actually expecting the bug of a missing space. But if we had a hard-coded string, the, 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 it would be easy to see that we should have a space there. So use hard-coded values when you assert on things, <coughs> instead of dynamically creating the expected values. And this, is a, this applies for unit testing. In integration tests, you might have random numbers and threads and loops and whatever. But in unit tests, this is not needed. It shouldn't be required. 
because tests are consistent. They're always running the same test. They're only supposed to help you build a skeleton, a working skeleton of your application, especially test-driven development. So I don't consider these tests to be the ultimate thing that covers all my application. They're covering the happy path, the thing that is just the basics of the application. And once I have these unit tests, I can go ahead and go crazy with integration tests and loops and ranges and have an Excel file with a million values and see what happens. But all these tests will be in a separate project because they need file systems or they take a long time or anything like that. These tests are supposed to be simple and readable and they should not have any bugs in them. It should be the stupidest thing in the world. Hard-coded values in the asserts. If you want to trust your tests, in unit tests, never use things that keep changing because it's going to be really hard to debug your tests. And, it, and every time you run it, it's actually a different test. So if you're using the current time, every time you run the test, it's actually a different test. And for unit tests, it shouldn't matter. For unit tests, you should use hard-coded values because it makes things more readable. Also, <coughs> if you use things that keep changing, it's very likely that also your asserts are dynamic and you have to build the expected values dynamically too. You don't know what the current time is, so you have to calculate what the expected value from the application is. And then we're back to the problem we just had, repeating production code. <coughs> All these things are good, but not in unit test. You can put them in an integration test project. Here is a, an example of a test that keeps changing. It's from an amazing, <coughs> amazing project called NerdDinner. It's an open source project that was created by Microsoft to show the benefits of ASP.NET MVC. Uh, and in there, they try to also show that they know some test-driven development. Um, but whoever wrote this did not have enough experience. So there are a lot of classic mistakes that we can cover here. Um, just zoom that for a second for you guys. Okay. Uh, first of all, for our purposes, we're using daytime now we might as well use a hard-coded date, because it shouldn't matter. Every time the test runs, we care just that it runs <coughs> with specific values. But then there are a lot of magic stuff going on. You're the reader of the test. You look at this test and you say, hmm, dinner should be valid when all property is correct. Okay. What's minus 92? Is that what's valid about it? Is it that it's negative? Is it that it's bigger than 90 or is lower than 90? What's, what's correct about the contact phone? Does it, is it that it has dashes? What's correct about it? What's correct about this, hosted by Scott Goo? Does it always have to be hosted by Scott Goo? Is he the only possible host? Or maybe that it's camel cased instead of regular casing? A lot of magic stuff going on. And one of these, the things that this test is not telling us is what's not important. But more importantly, this test is actually multiple tests hiding in a single test. Because each one of them should be in a separate test. And if we had that, the name of the test would be easier to understand because this is a very generic A. Because we don't know we, what are all the properties, what's correct about them. And also, if one of them fails, you don't know which one you have to start debugging and looking at the code. But for us, the basic stuff here is daytime now. And we'll cover more about readability issues after maintainability. So if you want your test to be maintainable, if you don't want to keep chasing problems, whenever you fix this little thing in your production code and suddenly 50 tests go, <coughs> nope, then you should start by looking at testing only, starting testing only through public interfaces. Now, a lot of people have a problem with that. So to understand why I like this approach, I want to explain that when I use the word unit in a unit test, what I mean is a unit of work. And a unit of work is anything that, this is a good example of a black box. Uh, it's anything that has a public API. You start by calling a public API, it's not private. Because any private method eventually gets called by some public method. No private method exists in isolation. It just exists there. But if no one calls it, does it really make a sound? Private methods never exist in isolation. There is always a public method that starts an interaction or a use case in the system. 
But we always have a public API that starts some use case in the system. So a unit of work in our test is something that starts with a public API and ends <coughs> here with one of three end results, returning a value or throwing an exception, changing the state of the system, like adding users, and now we can log in the user, and calling a third party, calling a logger or a web service. But before these results happen, there could be calls to 500 private methods here. And we shouldn't care about that. Because these are just implementation details. They can change. And if we test that these methods got called or that they're working separately, it wouldn't mean that a unit of work actually works. We might have a private method here that works perfectly, but no one calls it. Okay? Or no one calls it with the correct parameters. So it doesn't mean anything in our test that the method works. We just wasted time. So we always start with a public API and we check an end result somewhere and we, and we don't try to check anything in the middle. The more we test private stuff, the more brittle, the more fragile our test becomes. The more you start hating your job after three, four, five months. Um, to be able to maintain your test, you should uh, treat your test code almost as nicely as you treat your production code sometimes even better. Because test code actually applies to a lot of production code. A single test or can actually apply to multiple uh, production code. And if you cannot read the test, you're going to have a big problem actually understanding that the code works. But also to maintain it, imagine a simple case. Okay? Imagine a simple case where we have 50 tests that use a specific class. And now we go ahead and we add a constructor parameter to the class. Okay. Now we have 50 <coughs> tests that don't even compile. We have to go to each test and add the parameter to the creation of the object in that test. And that's a maintainability issue. So we can easily avoid that by using a factory method um, or using setup uh, methods in our tests. Don't use setup methods in your test because that actually hurts readability. But you can definitely use uh, helper methods that create objects and then recall these methods from your tests. And like that, you just have to change one place to fix all the tests. So don't repeat yourself is an important rule in unit tests. But you can actually take it too far until you hurt readability. So this, these rules are great until you start hurting readability. Then you go back a bit. It's more important to be readable than maintainable. It's more important to be maintainable than not maintainable. Um, so we, I have factory methods in my test that create objects. Sometimes I, I see that I have multiple tests that take an object to a specific state. For example, a calculator that has been called three times, or a calculator that is an in invalid state. And I see that I have three tests doing the same thing. They call it three times, and, and so it's invalid. So I would have a helper method that just calls it three times. I say init calculator to be invalid. And I call it from three tests. Because when I see it being used multiple times, it's actually a use case in the system. It's a state of, a, of an <coughs> object in the system. And that state of, or the definition of what an invalid calculator is could change tomorrow. And then I would again have to change multiple tests. Instead, I can just change this method and all tests will go back to running. And sometimes, if I'm not using n units, if I'm using uh, things like MS test, then I don't have the ways to assert that something throws an exception. Um, or I don't have ways to have parameterized tests. Uh, so if I have multiple tests that are exactly the same and the only thing different is the inputs and the expectations of the output, then I would have methods that have asserts in them and they're just helper methods. They set up the objects and then I just have multiple tests that are just one line long. And each one of them just calls the helper method that asserts inside. And all these things help the maintainability a lot. We want our tests to be maintainable. We want to make sure that <coughs> our tests never depend on other tests. So I've seen people write tests that actually execute other tests while running. And one of the reasons people do that is to reuse code. But instead of reusing code that way, you can just reuse using helper methods. Tests should be able to run alone. They should be able to run in any order. So any test lives in its own world and should not care that there are other tests out there. You should 
not expect any state to be there. It should create the state that it needs. Let's say, even if it's an integration test, I would say create uh, information in a database at the beginning of the test and clean up or roll back the database at the end. For a unit test, it's even more important because unit tests have to be fully consistent, should always be running, should always be passing if you haven't changed anything. So it doesn't, shouldn't matter which state we run the test in. And to do that, each test is in charge of its own. <coughs> And we can use helper methods to, to, use, to, to make it readable, maintainable, but each test is responsible. You don't set up the data once and ho have all the tests use a shared data source. Use, you re reinitiate the data source between each test. If you want your test to be maintainable, one of the best ways to do it is to say that you want to test a single thing per test. So usually, uh, when I see multiple asserts, here, see two asserts here. If I see two asserts and they're on different objects, here and here, it usually tells me something. Um, it tells me that there are two important issues that have to be here. When I said a unit of work has to have uh, an end result, sometimes you can have multiple end results. Doing something both gives me a message and also has this result, so it has two end results. A system state change, and a value that was returned. And I want to test each one of them in a separate test. Because what happens if this assert fails? It actually throws an exception. That means that this line will never execute. I will never know if this works or not. And this is a separate requirement. Each one of them should work separately. And if I have multiple asserts and the first one is failing, all the other ones will never execute. So I'm like a doctor was watching uh, symptoms for a patient, but I only know two of five symptoms. And I have to guess how to treat the disease. So that might send me to start fixing the wrong thing. And then I run it again, and I see that this passed, but now this failed. So now, did it fail because I fixed it, or did it always fail? And in a book called X-Unit Test Patterns, this is called <laughs> the Surgeon Roulette. It makes sense, I like that name because you don't know what's going to happen in the next assert. If you had them in a separate test, then this would fail and you would see if this is passing or failing at the same time. And you would have a better understanding of the system. So multiple asserts on the same object usually <coughs> shouldn't be a problem. But if they're on different objects, they are. And the reason is, if they're on a single object, it's usually the same concern, the same end result that you care about. So if one of them failed, you already don't care about the others. But if they're on different objects, if one of them fails, you still want to know what happened to the other ones. That's when you should separate the, the, the asserts to different tests. So the maintainability aspect really gets hurt by this. Because you change something, it fails, and then you're left wondering what really happened. Maybe you start commenting out some asserts to see what happens. But that's the whole point. You should have had it in a separate test anyway. Here's an example of multiple asserts from real project. Um, <coughs> so, look at that. Assert that all number types are accepted. This is an important method, okay? <coughs> this is a conversion method. And each one of these, okay, each one, double, long, flow, each one of these is a separate requirement. It could not, it might fail with float, but it would still work with double. Each one of them is working separately. However, in this test, if the first one fails, we have no idea what happened to all the other ones. Do they still work or not? And so we start debugging the test. Comment that out and see what happens. Or, even worse, we fix the first one and then the rest start failing and we don't know if they failed already or was it because we fixed something. That's, that's the very big problem. Imagine trying to fix this test and, and the test keeps saying, uh-uh, wrong, and then at the end of the day you just say, you know what, I'm just going to separate it. And then you'd see there are three failures, whatever you do, and then you can see where the shared source is for those three failures and where to fix it, instead of just going one and one and one. Here's another example of multiple asserts. <coughs> this, is, this is actually a pretty complicated example. This is what happens when engineers <laughs> engineer tests in the most 
engineered way possible. Okay. Uh, so what we have here, we don't even have the beginning of the test, but what we have here is an array, and each item in the array is actually an object that has two properties, a parameter with this value, and an action which is a delegate or a callback. And each one of these objects is actually invoking a different overload of the HTML helper routing. So each one of these lines is actually a test for a different overload. You can see in the comments. The fact that you need comments is usually not a good, uh, good, good thing. Uh, but you can see that each one of them is a separate <coughs> overload, is a separate method that's being tested. So we create this array, and then here we have a loop. We go through each thing in the array, and we assert that it throws an exception giving specific values. So each one of them, each one of these overloads should be throwing an exception. But since it's a loop, and it's only a single test, what happens if this overload doesn't throw an exception? The whole loop stops, the whole test fails, and maybe this one works, maybe this one works, maybe this one fails, we don't know. So there is no information to help us figure out the problem, very little information. So these are multiple asserts hiding in a very nicely engineered way. As an engineer, I like the structure. But as someone who works with unit tests, with maintainability, this is horrible. These should all be separate tests. Here's another example of uh, multiple <laughs> certs. This is from JavaScript. Oh, actually, this is uh, in Java as well. Uh, another conversion. Actually, we covered uh, conversions uh, already. But it's another example of converting numbers to the specific the strings to the specific values. And again, each one of them is a separate requirement. I should be able to do this regardless of whether this failed or not. Each one of them is a separate requirement. Each one of them should be failing separately. But multiple asserts also come in uh, different ways. Uh, has anyone here ever used mock objects? in your tests. Who knows what mock objects are? Okay, I'm going to explain shortly. Mock objects are objects that are, that pretend to be other objects. For example, we have a web service, but we don't really want to use the real one, so we create a fake version of it. And then we check that someone called it. And then we say, look, if the fake one got called, we're going to assume that in production, the real one will get called. That way our tests can run faster. So a mock object is an example of something that you assert against. That is, what is, and it's trying to prove that your application calls a third party service somewhere that you do not control. So you fake it. That's one end result. So a mock object represents one end result. So if you have, uh, if you see the word verify in tests, it usually means that we're expecting some mock object that, to be called. But here we have two mock objects. It doesn't really matter what they do. The fact that we have two means that we are checking two things in this test. Two things are expected to be called in this test. That usually is the beginning of something that's wrong, because it's just like multiple asserts on different objects. If this one didn't get called, the test will fail. It will throw an exception in this line. So this line will never execute. We'll never know if the other object was called or not. So regardless of whatever happens in this test, whether it's readable or whatever, this should be separated into two different tests if we really care about both of them. A lot of times, people assert on fake objects even when they don't need to. That's a separate problem. But you should have no more than a single mock object per test. You have multiple stuff, which is just things that you fake, but you don't assert against. Uh, the logger doesn't work yet, so we're going to fake it so we can just run the application. That's a stub. But if we assert it in that call, it's a mock object. Okay, readability. Uh, structure is really important to readability. And I've seen some horrible structures out there, but this is a good example of one. What I like about it is that there is, I, there is um, predictability. If I see a, uh, a project up in the source, I can pretty much guess where the tests for that project are. I don't see integration, but I do see configuration. That tells me maybe that's an integration test. Maybe not. So there is no separation from unit and integration. But in terms of finding something and where something is, it's really important for me as a programmer to keep, uh, to keep everyone happy and easily find what they need. 
if I can't find a test for a specific class, uh, then uh, maybe I won't actually run it if I don't know which <coughs> project to run. Okay. Um, let's talk more about readability. Uh, a lot of times what happens is that we initialize objects in tests, but we initialize them far away from where the test actually is. So we might have these magic variables. Uh, whatever, should not transform table if transform not found. Whatever that means. But then we see this item, table as string. Okay, assert that whatever it is is equal to table as string. <coughs> but table as string was not defined anywhere. It doesn't exist anywhere. Now I, to understand what it is, I have to go and find two places in the code to understand the test. And, and, and if I treat my test for the reader, I don't want the reader to have to jump between two places to understand the tests. So as a programmer, what I want is for my test to be fully contained, just like a little story, so that the reader of the test, even if they just came in to the job today, they can look at the test and say, you know what, I can figure this out. I don't have to go and ask anyone for, uh, for uh, answers. Uh, in my courses, I say, you know, imagine that the reader of the test is a serial killer that knows where you live. So try not to get them to ask you any unnecessary questions. Okay? Don't piss them off too much. Because they will go to your house with an axe and ask you. So don't make them ask any questions. So table and string is a hidden value. You have to look at the setup method or something like that. So more about serial killers. Sometimes I see tests that I have to maintain and they're named like this. And they're just like, oh, register again. And then you look at the test and there's nothing mentioned about it. it. has nothing to do with the actual test. Someone just wrote a name because they had to write a name just to satisfy the compiler. When you see names like this and the programmer is not there, you're just lost. That test almost means nothing. Is this the right assert that you should be doing? Nobody knows. What, what are you, what's supposed to happen? But the test name doesn't tell me. And with good test names, we should have three parts to the name of the test. <coughs> or we should have three pieces of information. We should, we, should, we should have the thing that we're testing. In this case, register. Okay. We should have the scenario or under which conditions we're testing it. Maybe get or by default is the scenario. And then we should also have what's expected, the expected behavior or the value or the expected call to a third party. But that's not written here. So we look at the assertion is we don't know if it's the right assert or not. So a lot of times we're missing these pieces of information. Um, okay, magic values. Magic values can be either just <laughs> random values that someone's just said, okay, where did that six come from? Why is it six? How did you know it was going to be six? I should go to your house and ask you. Okay? And then you start searching for the number six. And then you see that because nobody knows what six is, they start using it all over their tests as well. So you see six in hundreds of tests. Why? Seems like a good idea. Obviously, it means something if someone is using the number six. <coughs> but sometimes it has a reason. Sometimes six is because somewhere you have an object that is fake, but you hard-coded the number six into it right there. Okay? You look for six, and then you see in some object somewhere, there is a fake object called the fake membership provider. And in there, you override a method and say, this is the minimum required password length. That's why it's six. How did you not know that? And this is an example of values <coughs> that are connected into the <coughs> test code. But the test reader has no idea where that number came from. So one way to solve it is to have six as some const and have the test use the const so that they know where the value comes from. And have the const be a good name. Sometimes it can be a bit worse. Sometimes. You might have these <coughs> fake objects, but they require hidden protocols, magic passwords, and that to be able to change the behavior. This is a, an example of a fake object, and someone is hard-coded that if you create a, a user using some user, this is actually part of the test, it's not production code. If the username equals some user and the, good, and the password equals good password, <coughs> the email equals email, 
then I want you to fake a membership status of success. Otherwise, if you want to fake a different value, then in the email string, just write the name of the enum that you want to send in. Or imagine the poor reader of the test, where they see a user with an email that doesn't look like an email. It looks like a, like a, like a membership create status dot something. And they have no idea why. Or they see members created with some user and good pass, and they ask themselves, how did you know that that is a good pass? How did you know that this will actually succeed? So the reader of the test has no idea why the test behaves the way it does. Because the test, the logic of the test is in multiple, uh, multiple places. So again, using cons or having the test configure the object from the test itself <coughs> is a much better way. Because this, only the person who wrote this helper method knows how to write the test for this. Everyone else will just look at the test and have no idea why some users uh, with that password, some users have these weird emails. Here's another example of magic values. Okay, this is uh, this is actually with in JavaScript with the Jasmine framework. Um, if you go to <coughs> JavaScript, this is actually a test for the Jasmine framework with just Jasmine framework. It's actually testing itself. So it prints the proper output under a pass scenario with large numbers, and then you have something simulator run and then 57. Okay, and why 57? What's the point? And when I, when I use values, I use the simplest values so that I don't need to ask any questions. Or I use cons or ver meaningful variable names. For example, if 57 didn't matter, I would put it in a variable and say some random number or some number of, uh, of instances so that the reader of the test will understand what's not important. That's one of the biggest things we can do about readability is to tell the reader what they shouldn't care about. So 57, is 57 important? Why not 56? Why not 30, 33? What's a large number? Okay, larger than 50? Then we have this, uh, these are the results, total count seven, why seven? Why not three, why not four? Then we have expect something to match three with zero failures. Look, I don't see any three here. There's nothing to, to say that there are three of something here. Is it the three items here? Maybe. Could be. We're not sure. And that's a very important thing, is that there are so many questions. And where the hell did I get these numbers? Where did that come from? Okay, there are so many mysteries. So I don't want, as a reader of the test, to play Sherlock Holmes and to start looking for 1777 in the test code. Probably not. <coughs> I want to be able to have either simple numbers or variable things that tell me this is the same number that you're going to find there. So that it's like a pointer for reference instead of me having to find it myself. 57. Are there 57 dots here? Did I literally have to create that manually? Maybe. Am I actually going to count it? No. Okay. So this test could have been simpler and more readable by removing n large numbers or making them much more uh, readable with variable names. Here's another simple test with the magic number, 50. Now again, you don't have to be an expert on the domain to see these problems in tests. And that's maybe a, the very important lesson. You, I can come into a, a company and look at your tests and see problems regardless whether I know your product or not. If I know your product, I will actually find even more problems. But there are problems that are cross-cutting. They have nothing to do with product. Magic numbers, or the fact that you're not saying what the number means, are an example of that. Uh, cannot configure a method with refparams. Okay? I think we have all the three types here. The thing we're testing, the scenario, um, and what's the expected behavior. Because we have an expected exception, so it's expecting an exception. So it says cannot. But where does 15 come from? Is 15 the number of methods in a class? Is it the number of characters in a string? Is it the number of seconds that have to pass until the test runs? Uh, I never found out, by the way. If you want to make your test readable, uh, 
Stop using the word mock for everything, please. Everyone says, oh, I'm going to mock that, I'm going to mock that, but they're not really, they don't really know what they're saying. Because when people use the word mock, they're actually just saying, I'm going to create a, a fake instance of that object so that I shouldn't care about it. A mock is specifically saved for these cases where you assert that an object got called. And that's why I use a different terminology. Because based on how I use that object, it looks like another object. If I assert against it, it's a mock. If I don't, it's a stub. So everything is a fake object. So I call everything fake. A fake principle is something that looks like a pri an I principle, and in some tests I might assert against it, and in some tests I might not. So it might be a mock or a stub in different tests. And I don't want to commit to the fact that it's always a mock object. It just <laughs> confuses. Once you know the difference between mock and stub, this is actually very confusing. Now, maybe you might say, well, maybe I shouldn't know the difference between a mock and a stub, and then I shouldn't care. But you should know the difference between a mock and a stub. Because if you have more than a single mock in a test, then you're testing too many things. You should, it's just like having multiple sets. But you can have multiple stubs in a test. So the understanding should be there when you read the tests. So the word mock is so overloaded, people use it for everything. So this is an example of how I usually try to name unit tests if I'm not using a BDD framework. Uh, I use actually three parts and I separate them with the underscore. This is really helpful if, you're, if your developers are new to unit testing because it makes sure when you review that, that people don't forget to put the, the important parts in the name. And the first part is the thing that you're testing, the unit of work, the beginning, the, public, the beginning of the public method. And here, the middle part is the scenario. Under which conditions are we actually testing this method. For example, we're sending in a number that's less than, the, than, than zero. And here, we're checking that an exception was actually thrown. So the, uh, we're either saying the expected return value for the exception, or what state change should happen, or that a call to a third party should have happened. Um, sometimes I have the exact same test. test and I have these shared methods that I assert, I just put a number at the end if I cannot use attributes and use parameterized tests. Then I know it's exactly the same test, but with different parameters. Um, okay. Um, this is an example of a name that I would change from this to uh, maybe separate it with underscore so it's more readable. Because what I see is that People might have all these three parts, but there's this name convention where you just use camel cases and it all looks like this at the end. <sighs> well, maybe this is not so bad, but this is actually much worse. <coughs> Let's see. Can anyone read this test name in a single uh, breath? Execute core with a synchronous invoker and action complete successfully. You see how easy it is? It's actually very simple. But just look at how hard it is to read this thing. So programmers, it's easy for us to write it, but it's, it's more, more of a write-only. It's really hard to read. Um, OK. So if there are any questions, we're just about to finish um, talking about naming. You might want to start thinking about interesting questions. Um, one la a couple of last things. I, uh, what I usually try is not to have very, very long lines, but lines that are separated by, uh, by the, that the assert is usually on a separate line. The only time that doesn't work is with my test exceptions. But notice how much more readable this is. I once had a line so, uh, so, so wide where it says, assert is true, blah, 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 equals false. But the equals false was way here. You had to scroll to the page to understand that the, the test is actually asserting the, the opposite of what you think. I don't know if someone did that on purpose. But it was an example of why lines should not be too wide. 
so that you can actually read and not have the test lie to you. Then you can also use the message in multiple things after it. For example, instead of asserting our equal, one thing I would change about this test is maybe not our equal, but contains. Um, so this is relatively new, something I'm going to add in my, in, to my book, is that when you assert on strings, asserting that strings are equal to a specific strings could actually be a maintainability nightmare. Because strings are a form of UI. They might have tomorrow an extra space at the end, or an extra date at the beginning, or line breaks. So all the tests that, uh, that, that tell you exactly what a string should look like can easily break even though the, uh, the actual middle content of the string is still good. That's usually what we care about. So I would say that for, for strings, I would usually stop using assert and I would start using string assert. So string assert that the string actually contains these words, and then if tomorrow someone in production code adds the date here, or uh, an extra space or a line break, my test won't fail, because the important words are still there, the core message. I don't want to assert on formatting. I want to assert on content. Because formatting is a UI problem. And tests for UI are horribly, horribly unmaintainable. I keep trying. Every year I do more and more uh, trials and experiments with new tools that test the UI. And every year it fails again. Because after a week, things start breaking. Because UI changes all the time and you keep having to change the tests. It works, but after a week, you've changed things so much that you just stop doing it. The pain is too big. So it's still not worth it to do UI testing. So if you're testing strings, just assert uh, that something contains something. It's a much more maintainable way to, to think about it. Um, yeah. Um, more about readability. <coughs> Whenever you have two values, always use different values. So this one is actually much more readable than the other one. Because the other one might look important. One and one, that looks kind of important. <coughs> one and two, oh, it looks just like a series of numbers. Whenever you see A, B, C, you don't care. But when you see A, G, F, maybe you do care. So our brain is designed to see patterns when you read code. So if you see uh, consecutive things, that make sense together, we stop caring about them. We just see that someone just said, oh, two numbers. Just like when you read loops, you see i and j, and you don't, you don't care about these variables. And here is the same thing. When I see one and two, I usually say, oh, it's just two numbers. When I see three and seven, I say, these are not just two numbers. These are very important numbers. Because it doesn't make any pattern. It doesn't, it doesn't ring true to me. So when I don't care about the numbers and I don't want to use variable names, I just use the most basic ones and I use consecutive values. But there's even, even a more problematic thing here. If I use one and one, and the order of the parameters may, uh, is important, if I send in one and one, the test will actually pass even if the order got, I got the order wrong, because it's the same value. If I use one and two, the ordering is important. If I got the ordering wrong, my test might fail. Um, but here is an example of something that looks like two things, but it's just one. You even have to send a string that, 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 con that contains multiple items, or an array that contains multiple items. <coughs> Make sure that the things in the thing that you're sending are different, so that people can see patterns. Because a string with one and one kind of looks suspicious. A string with one and two looks much less suspicious. So all, all the time, think about the usability or the readability of the test and how many questions someone has to ask you before they can actually understand it. Uh, and that actually concludes our three pillars of readability, maintainability, and trust. Now, again, you can break each one of them separately and it will break all the others. If you cannot trust the test, you're not going to bother reading it. That's my mother. Okay, thanks mom. Uh, if you don't trust the test, you're not going to read it. You don't read it, you're not going to bother maintaining it. If you can't maintain it, you're not going to trust it at some point. If you can't read it, nothing else matters. Okay? Questions? Yeah. Now there is a bug in iPhone where you have a call. 
we had an iTunes running. <laughs> <laughs> if they had a unit test for that, that would be great. Yes. I'm not sure I got the distinction you make between the uh, the mock, the stub, and the fake. Okay. Mock, stub, fake. Um, actually, maybe I can write it here. Okay. So uh, we have a fake. Fake is a basic unit of work here for us. If something looks like something else, it's a fake. Okay. Now, if you assert against it, it's a mock. Otherwise, it's a stub. That's it. So if it tells you if the test failed or not, it's a mock object. If it's just there making happy noises and you never assert against it and you can't fail your test, it's a stub. It should be simple. Now, there is a book called X Unit Test Patterns, and in there, there are five classifications of fake objects. Test, spy, a mob, a stub, two others, which I don't even remember. Okay? It shouldn't matter to you. If you want to create readable, maintainable tests, if you understand these three things, that's all you need to know. Everything else is a sub-classification of these three things. Okay? Other questions? Yes. Uh, could you elaborate on how you approach uh, with negative tests? You mentioned happy part. Yeah. So when do I approach negative tests? Yeah, how do you do this? Well, uh, how do I do negative tests? Well, first of all, if I do test driven development, and I, I want to stress that the reason I do test driven development is because I'm trying to test my tests. Because there is no way to test your test. So test driven development, the first uh, thing you do is that you start with a failing test. You're supposed to have a failing test. It's part of the point. But why? Because one of the good things about it, you start with a failing test, and then without touching the test, just by touching production code, the test magically should start passing. And that's actually us testing the test. We're testing that it fails when it should, and it passes when it should. That's a great way to, great, to gain trust in the fact that a test is actually passing and not lying to you. Because it did fail when there was a bug. You saw it fail at the beginning. Uh, now, when I do test driven development, I, I use the test to drive development. The tests are not the point, the code is the point, the production code. So the tests are usually testing happy path scenarios. For example, <coughs> uh, I, want to, I want every test to add a new scenario of real functionality. I don't want the test to add a scenario of invalid stuff. If I have uh, something that takes in a string, I will use only valid strings at the beginning to build all the functionality. Because that way, I can actually have something to demo at the end of the day. If I start just by focusing on all the things that could go wrong in the inputs, I can spend the whole day working on that, and then my manager will come and say, hey, bro, what's up? And I say, well, I don't have anything working, but it handles all the invalid stuff amazing. And the point here is that you can actually drive functionality. So it's like mini iterations. So after I have the baseline, then I start adding all, that, all the negative stuff. What happens when I send in this string and that string? But those things are usually less important because until I can actually show and get feedback that this is what people want, then all the negative stuff doesn't, ma doesn't matter. Unless whatever I'm building is supposed to just handle negative things. Okay? So uh, when you revisit the, um, write the negative test, is it uh, kind of within a sprint or like the next day? or? Is it um, uh, usually, if I finish a feature, it already includes all the negative stuff. Uh, it's not done until it's done. But I can't show a demo until I have real functionality. So I start with real functionality. Um, however, I might have sprints where I just need to show feedback at the end of the sprint. I don't do sprints anymore, by the way. But assuming that I had, to, at, the, I, at the end of every month, I do a demo. So I always want to have something to show at the end of the month. Sometimes I have negative stuff, sometimes not. But it's not an issue. It's just something that either it worked, that it's just something that you have to do. But it's not as important as just making it work for the basic use case. Okay? So adding a user without change, uh, checking validation is more important than, uh, than checking that a user is invalid. Unless you're a security consultancy and that, that, that's the most important thing. Other questions? Do you test events? If so, do you, uh, how do you solve the uh, internal dependencies? 
well, like test events, like uh, when I register, I, I can subscribe to an event. Yeah. Yeah. Test. I test that an event is fired. Not I don't test that there is an event. I just test that, let's say, I want to to know every time someone called an object. And that's a public use case, public API. So I register to the event and I call the object and I and I see that I have a flag that's set to true. Well, that's a very simple way. I just register to the event and I see that I got a notification. Do you test the logic, internal log logic of the uh, event itself? I never test internal logic. I always test the end result. The internal logic is already only there to change the end result. If there is a lot of logic and the end result is exactly the same, do I care? No. Okay. So for example, if I have an event, but the event should only be thrown in these specific inputs, then I will just subscribe to the event and send in different inputs and only see if I, if I get the notification or not, just the end result. Yes, I will end up testing the internal logic, but only through public APIs. Okay? I never test private methods. Because if I do test real development, I never have private methods at the beginning. I always start with something public. And then when it works, I just extract these private methods from it. Just like uh, when you make pizza and it becomes longer, and I want pizza now. But never mind that. When you have a public method and you want to extract methods from it, then what you get is a lot of private methods, but you have tests only for the public stuff that you created at the beginning. And it covers all the private stuff in the, in the end anyway. You're going to get good coverage. But you shouldn't care that there is something private in there. Because the problem is just an implementation detail. It could all have been one method that's public with a thousand lines of code if you really wanted to. But it could. Okay? Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Um, so if you are interested in knowing more, um, you can always contact me uh, through royal at bouvet.no. Let's see. We should have... Uh, I should have put my details at the beginning. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. PowerPoint on that. It's very helpful. So if you always want to contact me, you can always do it either through Twitter or through my email address. Um, I'm also uh, starting to do some extra courses about JavaScript. There's been a lot of demand for that. Uh, Ruby, Java, and C Sharp. So whatever you want. That's actually uh, one of the last things that I can do now is actually do consulting and coaching. So for example, yesterday I was at uh, fin.no and I was uh, actually teaching a, a team leader course there. I also was reviewing some tests, etc. So it was a pretty interesting thing. We were, we were looking at the build system and the automation. So I usually like to look at things at two different uh, planes. There is a more people-oriented stuff and there is more technical stuff. I usually I can jump between those two things. So if you're interested in any of that, that stuff, feel free to uh, let me know. And I'm, uh, I'm here for questions as well. And we can talk over lunch too. Okay, thank you very much. Have a good one. Uh,